Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. Scholars, welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Burger. I'm a professional artist and a master educator. And I'm here to attempt to provide you with the best in our historical content. Today, I'm here with Eva and Hank, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about a specific area of art. Well, it just goes, what the hell are you talking about? So today, we're on location. Where are we at, Hank? We're at the hut. So we're out here in North Carolina, playing in the water, having a good time. But one of the things that events like this remind me of are the earthwork artists that create uh, their artworks right in the earth and actually my daughter made me think of that she was making this very specific uh, creation in the water and had lined up her rocks and things like that and it made me think about the earthwork artists that create these kinds of things and so today I thought it'd be a good idea to come out and take a look and explore the earthwork artists that are so fantastic and maybe there are some that you know and maybe some that uh, you're less familiar with. So, without further ado, while we play, I'm going to explain to you a little bit about earthwork artists. First off, I think it's important to explore the idea of what environmental art is. It's quite a broad term, but environmental art like land art, earthworks, sustainable art, conceptual art, etc. All kind of fall under the same practice of environmental art. And these are works that are designed for a specific location and if removed from that location they would lose some or all of its intended meaning. But this style of artwork emerged in the 1960s and with leading artists such as Jean Max Albert, Nancy Holt, Dennis Oppenheim, and Mao Zudo, the work would become quite popular. Tell you what, let's do. Although it's relatively new, its roots go all the way back to the Industrial Revolution when there was an outpouring of a response to the increased levels of pollution in the environment. And again, going even further back, there are examples of Paleolithic paintings and land modifications by our prehistoric ancestors. Now, environmental works can be indoors or outdoors, urban, rural, marine, or in numerous other settings. Some of these works might be called environmental installations. An installation is a room size or a larger space where the whole space is considered a single artwork. It's really one cohesive work of art. Artists like Ai Weiwei, Kara Walker, Judy Chicago, Bruce Nauman, and Joseph Boys are known for their installation artworks. And with a little bit better idea of what environmental artwork is, let's look at a number of artists who really focus their energy and efforts toward the creation of these environmental artworks. Starting with one of the leading artists from the 1960s, Robert Smithson. Now, although he only lived to be 35 years old, Robert Smithson was one of the major environmental artists of the 20th century. He was born in New Jersey and had a lifelong interest in nature. He remembered that when he was about eight years old, his family took a trip across the United States and this would have a profound impact on his future. He would go on to the Art Students League in New York, starting his training there while he was still in high school. And although he did attend the Art Students League, he had a pretty limited background in art training. Now, as he began his professional art career, he was really inspired by lots of different artists, but chose to create works in two very distinct categories. He had created sites, he also created non-sites. Now, the non-sites began with actual sites. From these locations, he would collect three different types of artifacts. Documents, geological artifacts, and containers. The documents are placed on the gallery walls. These would be maps, photographs, and other text-based resources of the actual sites. The geologic collections were placed on the floor around the gallery space and also put into the containers. These geological objects may be presented along with mirrors and other things to really heighten our focus on them, as well as a visual connector between the earth and the sky. Can I try it really quick? In the 1960s, he began to create plans for larger scale site works. 
Smithson was going to move far beyond what was considered acceptable art media. His art was not made of paint and paper or fired clay. His artwork was the earth itself. He began to create earthworks. Simply put, earthworks are artworks that are made of and by nature, and its location is often specifically selected for the intended work, and we would call this site-specific. Now obviously, because the artwork is designed for this selected place, the only place you can see the artwork is to actually go to that specific location. Spiral Jetty is an example of an earthwork by Robert Smithson that was created for a site-specific location. In 1970, he had finished that enormous 1,500 foot long and 15 foot wide spiral rock and dirt jetty that had projected into the Great Salt Lake at Rosal Point in Utah. A whopping 6,650 tons of material was used to create that jetty. He had said, well, it took two weeks of actual construction and about two months of negotiation and preparation. I was very pleased and very happy after I had made it. I'm an artist. I just create. It's up to you guys to read your traits. <laughs> Another artist that works with environments and sites as well as installations is Maya Lin. Now, she's an artist that I've talked about before, and you can go back and take a look at the video that I did on her as well as other artists in this series. However, we're probably most familiar with her Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Now, that being said, beyond the construction of monuments and memorials, she also is known for her design of natural environments and installations. Her use of natural materials to create landscapes that roll and wave to appear like a water wave or something like that, but grass, is really a unique approach to what other environmental artists do and have done. We can see this in her work from 2008 called Storm King Wave Field. In this, there are seven ridges of waves that ascend 15 feet high and the ridges stretch some 300 feet. Now this work itself sets on an 11 acre patch of land and she's done a series of three of these and let her explain that. We all know what a water wave looks like but I'm always trying to get you to take a different look at it. The first wave field is in Michigan. The waves are three to five feet high. You deliberately can sit in almost a cupped wave, read a book. It's very intimate in scale. The second in the series tripled the scale of the site so from 10,000 it went to 30,000 and the waves were much more reminiscent of how water travels over sand so these waves were only about a foot high so it became a very different relationship how you walk through it and I always knew that I wanted to culminate the series with a field that literally when you were in it you became lost inside it so the waves had to become much larger than you these waves range from 12 to 18 feet above your head and whether you walk through a row of waves or whether you're walking wave to wave from the high to the low to the high to the low very interested in how it changes beyond works like this she's also influenced by other things from her everyday life her life as a mother and an approach to art that is very unique in my mind about a year ago i started using my garbage to make artworks and so this is one of the first ones I did it's actually mostly FedEx boxes and it's just a little recycled landscape and then I started just working with my kids toys because it's almost embarrassing how much junk we amass so these are all part of a series of toy asteroids what's the last known position of the closest asteroid storm the artworks of Charles Simmons fit firmly into this art idea. He creates miniature environments that are installed into the interior spaces and at times are designed for site-specific locations. He became best known for his tiny little ruins by the little people that are extinct according to his own story. Now these little people, they are loosely based on a Native American society that he has invented for the purposes of creation in his artworks. Now anybody familiar with the Daniel Quinn book Ishmael would probably call these people leavers. And I've even had former students make a connection between the little people and a parallel story in The Indian in the Cupboard, a 1980 book from Lynn Reed Banks. 
Now he began his art process kind of as a street artist or a graffiti artist except in a sculptural context instead of the use of a rattle can but at any rate his work would eventually catch on like many other street artists like Jenny Holzer or Jean-Michel Basquiat and he would start creating little dwellings for various galleries and art collectors. In his works, there are basically three types of architectural creations. There are circular, spiral, and line. He would describe all three of these in his 1975 book, Three People. The works are each complete with miniature tools, ladders, and other little details that you really got to get down and look at to discover. Now these works are generally inside and covered because it's created from unfired clay and any water at all could literally cause it to disintegrate. But it's his opinion that these works don't have to stand the test of time. They're intended to dissolve and go away eventually. And that's pretty evident from the original works that he started making in the streets of New York and many of those absorbed and destroyed and dissolved back into the earth. Oh, come on, bucko. The Bulgarian-born Christo is another example of an artist that uses the environment to his advantage when it comes to creating environments and installations for his artworks. Stacked oil drums and running fence and even his Gates projects and others very much show his connective tissues between his art and the physical natural world. The focus on this work or environments began in 1968. All of these works are temporary, and he has to go through a great expense and time to get permits and planning and preparation for these works to ever be created. And they're only up and created for a very, very short period of time. Oh, damn, damn, damn. In 1983, he would create the installation of Surrounded Islands. This was done in a little bay between Miami and North Miami, just off from Miami Beach. Eleven islands were surrounded by neon pink covering. 6.5 million square feet of floating pink fabric popped against the Miami shoreline. For two weeks, this pink fabric went around the islands, and so for seven miles down the coast, you could see the pink floating fabric all over Miami. In order to get to the islands, they had to make sure that it was safe for the workers and all that sort of thing. And so they had to go in with a huge team of people and remove over 40 tons of garbage from all of the islands so that the project was safe. And they did this at their own expense, leaving the islands better off than they were before they got there. And I mentioned permits. They had to get government permits from the governor of Florida, the Dade County Commission, the Department of environmental regulation, the City of Miami Commission, the City of North Miami, the Village of Miami Shores, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the Dade County Department of Environmental Resources Management. The funding for the project came from the selling of preparatory drawings, collages, and other artist renderings in order to sell those, generate the money to pay for the project, and then actually have it all completed to only be out there for a couple of weeks. They had a crew of 430 people go out there with the pink fabric and lay it all out with boats and anchors and all kinds of planning and preparation to make this whole thing get pulled off. When the project is removed, we connected, collected all the components of the project, archives, material, photographs, film, and each of our big project half exhibition like that. I don't know about you, but I take comfort in that. And now we come to an artist whose work in natural and urban settings as a sculptor, photographer, land artist, environmentalist, so forth, is Andy Goldsworthy. Often his transient art is created using media that is found at the site where the actual artwork is being produced. Now his media can include stones, sticks, ice, or any other natural materials that are accessible to him at the moment of creation. Now, at the age of 13, he began to work as a farm laborer, probably like a weekend job or something like that, after school type job. Anyway, he would begin to learn a little bit about agriculture and his interest in this and nature in particular would grow. The repetition of farm work is the training ground for the repetition that he would undergo as a professional artist. 
He was inspired by other artists like Robert Smithson, who we already talked about, and many, many others. And one of the ways that he was very much influenced is also in the way of photography. Goldsworthy would document with photographs the work that he was being produced, and in some cases, this is the only evidence that the work was ever even created. Although known for making artwork in and a part of nature, his work was also included in collections all around the world, including the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., the Institute of Art in London, and as we've talked about before, kind of a local plug, the Des Moines Art Center in Des Moines, Iowa. I think that's the beauty of art, that it just makes you step aside off the normal way of walking or looking. What I really appreciate about Andy Goldsworthy's work is that it's really not about the creation of art at all. His work is a representation of life and a need to make things that will not last. His work is really about the experience of making art, not really about the product at all. I hope you enjoyed that. Follow along for more.